welcome everyone to this HYPE uh, webinar. I am Daniele Tori and I am a lecturer in finance here at the um, Faculty of Business and Law. And uh, so the history and political economy of business and finance is a research cluster based at the Open University Business School, and it brings together scholars who aim at developing a critical approach to business and financial theory. So uh, what uh, HYPE does is to put forward an interdisciplinary research agenda using insight from both the perspective of political economy and history. And uh, today we are pleased to have Michael Oliver uh, presenting, which is a senior lecturer uh, in the Department of Accounting and Finance. And he spent almost 30 years teaching at various universities in the UK, France and US. And Michael also provides executive education, workshops uh, and a broad range of consultancy, both in the public and the private sector. In terms of research, uh, Michael's agenda has focused prim primarily on financial history, with a particular emphasis on monetary and exchange rate policy. And a core team of his research is the conflict between domestic and external policy goals and how policymakers have struggled to reconcile these. So Michael has written articles, chapters and books on financial crisis, the international monetary system, exchange rates, uh, reg exchange rate regimes and economic policy. And Michael's areas of expertise include monetary history, liquidity in financial markets, financial crisis, and the economics of small island states. And today, Michael will present a paper titled Non-Monetary and Monetary Explanation for the Inflation, uh, the UK in the 70s. So, uh, Michael, thanks uh, very much for presenting today. And uh, so the floor is yours. We will have a presentation and then we will open the floor for uh, questions. Thank you very much thank, again. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for everyone to spending their time listening to a period of economic history when I, I think, was in short pants, at least up until um, the mid 70s. Um, this paper actually arose <clears throat> from an invitation to speak at a conference on inflation at the University of Buckingham last month, organised by the Institute of Monetary Research. And as some of you might know, Tim Congdon, who chairs the centre, is one of the world's <coughs> leading monetary experts and put together a day of discussion surrounding the current inflationary situation. It's worth, I think, noting from the outset that Tim and his colleagues at Buckingham and a few others that were there publicly called the inflation we are experiencing today, about 18 months ago, along the traditional long and variable timelines because of the growth in broad money, which they focus on, not narrow money, broad money. And they wanted uh, someone to look at uh, a historical look at inflation in the 70s and contacted me. Now, of course, I spent some time looking at the 70s and it was a long while ago when I looked at it. Um, and although I have a swathe of official papers from this period, I've been, of course, as some of you also know, been focusing on the 1980s uh, at great length to produce various pieces. But one of the areas which has interested me over the last 15 to 20 years um, is the work by Edward Nelson, who has been at various different institutes, including at, currently at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Um, and on what he termed the monetary policy neglect of the post-1945 period, that is up until 1979. Um, and Forrest Cappy's book on the history of the Bank of England, uh, which goes from the 50s to 79, also stresses what he describes as the non-monetary approach to inflation during this period. And I'll talk a little bit more about those definitions sh shortly. And then in 2014, Duncan Needham produced a book based on his PhD, utilising Treasury and Bank Archives, which disputed the arguments put forward by Nelson, and KP. Now, Nelson and KP are both well-respected economists and economic historians. And after Tim's invitation, I decided to revisit the memoirs of some of the participants of the 70s and 80s um, and then draw on um, archival stuff, which Ed doesn't draw on. Ed's work is mainly using newspapers. I say, uh, yeah, it's primary, but it's using newspapers and other documents, but not so much the archives. And to see if any of the archival investigations I could come up with would actually correspond to either Needham's interpretation or Capers' interpretation. And to cut to the chase, and for those that don't want to sit around for the next 30, 40 minutes and hear me drone on about monetary history from the late 60s for the next, you know, X number of minutes, effectively, I would contend <clears throat> 
um, like Nelson and Capey, that, that monetary policy neglect holds for the 1970s. Very, I hope you can see these slides. Um, we tried earlier and they looked OK. Um, if we go back and, and think about what happened following the breakdown of the Bretton Woods exchange rate system in the early 70s, and there was a move, of course, to a regime of floating exchange rates. One of the biggest challenges facing policymakers at that time was how do you control inflation in a world without any internationally agreed monetary rules? And the problem of inflation became more pressing because of changing patterns in world payments, increased global capital mobility, and then the oil shock of 73-74, known as OPEC-1, they all combined to inflict both nominal and then real shocks on the international economy. Many countries struggled, of course, to adapt to the changing economic circumstances of the 70s, just as they are at the moment, but the UK performed particularly badly. And that table there is just a couple of macroeconomic indicators of the 70s, inflation, unemployment and productivity growth. You'll see the UK had the highest inflation out of a group of countries, um, the highest unemployment, and apart from the US, pretty slightly at the bottom of the table there with productivity growth. So that focus on inflation is particularly poor. Um, I've got a graph here showing the consumer price inflation the uk is the is the solid line and the dotted line is the oecd for that period the, sorry the g7 for that period between 1971 and 1980 so inflation somehow was more entrenched in the united kingdom than in any other country now since the 1970s so effectively over the last 50 years the techniques to control inflation have broadly fallen into these three main sort of areas each regime, I would say. The, each regi regime uses an explicit nominal anchor to achieve price stability. So you could say, first of all, monetary targets argued by the monetarists that there was a stable relationship between one or more monetary aggregates and the general level of prices, and that monetary policy should be directed at a particular rate of growth in that monetary aggregate. And that monetary aggregate was seen as an intermediate target, the final target, of course, being inflation. There was a gradual move towards monetary targets in many of those industrialized countries over the course of the 70s, so that by the end of the 70s, I think six of the G7 members had adopted targets. Speed up 10 years, by the end of the 80s, there had been a rapid downgrading of these rigid monetary rules, and by the early 1990s, monetary targets have been abandoned in favour of exchange rate targets and inflation targets. So the exchange rate targets and the prospect of widespread floating rates led to a core group of European countries, of course, to um, form, first of all, the snake and then the exchange rate mechanism, which we know, all know about as part of the EMS. And that quickly developed into a Deutschmark block during the 80s. The Deutschmark was the key currency. Member countries were required to follow the monetary policy of the Bundesbank. And then the intermediate target for members was to maintain an announced exchange rate against the DM. And, and the final objective again was inflation. And then finally, the inflation targets. So these were introduced when other techniques of monetary control were perceived as having failed. The UK in the early 1990s, Finland and Sweden in the wake of leaving the ERM, Canada, following the failure of monetary targeting. The key point is this, this last 50 years has been marked by a shift away from non-monetary explanations of inflation and towards monetary explanations. But it's far less clear, however, to the extent which money matters ever led to a genuine conversion to monetarism, despite the phrase monetarist experiment, which has been applied to the UK and US economic policy in the early 1980s. In the 2020s, there are no longer these intense, bitter debates between Keynesians and monetarists, as there were in the 70s, about the causes of inflation. And if you think about it, during the 70s, the excess supply of money over the demand for money led to product price inflation, and that was unwelcome, particularly by consumers. Post-1980 in the UK, with the growth in home ownership, Many, home, many homeowners welcome, of course, asset price inflation, although, of course, its pernicious effects can be seen in the mispricing of risk over the last decade. 
The focus of the paper then is quite clear. It's on the monetary and non-monetary explanations of inflation in the UK in the 70s. And first of all, I'm going to turn to explain how economic historians have favoured non-monetary explanations to account for the rise in inflation in the 70s. Then I want to look at the arguments from the monetarists in the 70s, and that was quite fun going back to looking at what the monetarists argued. I was at university in the late 1980s at Leicester, and we had some quite, you know, not violent debates, but quite vigorous debates between some of the Keynesian members of staff and the monetarists at the time. Um, and one of my thesis supervisors was George Zeese, who, of course, was quite influential in the 70s. I'll come back to George shortly. Then I want to turn to the work of Ed Nelson and his co-authors, who show how the authorities pursued policies steeped in the non-monetary view of inflation. And although, as I said, Nelson's arguments are supported by Forrest Cappy, Duncan Needham has a different approach. He has contended that um, as the UK authorities were already thinking about money supply targets um, in terms of monetary aggregates from the early 70s, there was no monetary policy neglect. Now, drawing on a range of sources, including Treasury and Bank archival documents and the memoirs that I mentioned, um, I explore in this paper how the UK authorities struggled with shaping a money supply policy from the late 60s to the early 70s. Then I consider the period between 1975 and 1979, and I argue that despite the money supply targets being introduced by the Labour government in July 1976, economic policy remained steeped in the non-monetary view of inflation. So what are the views on inflation in the 1970s from the mainstream economic history literature? Well, there are no monetary explanations of inflation in assessments of post-45 economic history texts from well-known authors such as Alec Cairncross, Sidney Pollard, Jim Tomlinson. There's no mention of inflation in the index of Adam Booth's 2001 textbook for students. And in the narrative, the causes and cures of inflation are seen through a very traditional Keynesian lens. For such authors, inflation post-45 is explained by patterns of demand pull, stop go, and then in the 70s, cost push. Insofar as the 70s are concerned at all, Roger Middleton is perhaps the, 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 the kindest towards uh, the connection between money growth and inflation when he writes, quote, most economists would be comfortable with a proposition that the Heath government should not have allowed the loose monetary policy of 71-73 that preceded the very high inflation that we now associate with the 70s. Now, in a chapter in a collection of essays on the 70s written about, well, almost 30 years ago, um, but Schultz and Woodward, they provide a slightly different approach to the traditional approach that economic historians uh, that I read at university um, uh, 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 discussed. They have argued that there are three peaks in inflation between 1967, 67 and 1980, as being caused by both non-monetary and monetary factors. And they label this an eclectic approach. Three peaks, the first inflation peak and using the RPI, which is what often economic historians do when they're doing comparative stuff for the 70s. It seems to be the CPI because there's data available for comparisons, not the RPI. The RPI inflation rose from 2% in 1967 to 10% in 1971. They argue it was caused first by the 1960-70 valuation of sterling and the transmission of US inflation to the rest of the industrialized world. Now, they acknowledge that these only explain in part the rise in British inflation, which continued to increase as those impulses worked through the economic system. So they argue the supply side disturbances were an influence and they cite the wage explosion of 1970-71 and conclude that the wage bargaining situation was bound to deteriorate at some point. The memories of the high unemployment of the interwar years faded. Those people left the labour market. Unions became more bellicose. Strains were placed on incomes policies and so on. So the first inflation peak, they argue, can be explained by an upsurge in world inflation coupled to a domestic wage push. And whilst Penelope Rowlatt, writing in 1988, gave both factors equal explanatory weight, she indicates the most important source of inflation was the endogenous wage price spiral. 
Now, in 72 and 73, inflation declined, but from the autumn of 1973, it began to rise again. And it rose to 15% in 1974, and it reached that peak of 27% in 1975. 27% in 75, again, on an RPI basis. Now, Shorts and Woodward on this point conclude it would be wrong to attribute the second peak entirely to the primary commodity price increases in OPEC-1. They point to the policy mistakes made during the Heath Barber years, the fiscal reflation in 1971, tax cuts in 72, and then the significant loosening of monetary policy, which I'll return to below. Inflationary expectations then were not well anchored by the design of the three-stage incomes policies with their destabilizing effects. And then finally, inflation began to rise again from 1978, where it stood at 11 percent, reaching a peak of 21 percent in 1980, again on an RPI basis. Three factors, they argue, contribute to this. First, a wage explosion, that social contract broke down, the winter of discontent, which Les will remember in 78, 79. Secondly, the second OPEC uh, shock in 1979, less spectacular than OPEC one, but I think led to crude petroleum prices rising by 126% between 1978 and 1980. And then finally, that increase in indirect taxation when Thatcher came into office in 79 and the reduction in the standard rate of tax from 33%, that was high then, wasn't it, to 30%. All well and good. That's what economic historians have argued, and perhaps Shorts and Wood were a bit more balanced than many of the uh, other authors I mentioned. But for monetary economists, accounting for inflation in the 70s had little to do with these negative supply side shocks or what we would term sociological explanations, trade unions. So the world money supply had grown rapidly in 71, 72 and in 1977 and 78. In other words, before OPEC 1 and OPEC 2. And it grew at between 10 and 13 percent a year. Now, some economists writing over the last 20, 30 years have argued that these expansionary monetary policies in the US and other countries amplified by the international monetary system led to higher inflation and to increases in world commodity prices, including the price of oil. So the causation is increase in the money supply, increase in the price of oil, increase in commodity prices. And the arguments clearly echo the work there of Milton Friedman who, writing in the mid-70s, took aim at those who confused changes in relative prices with those uh, that talked about changes in absolute prices. And there's a nice quote from him there, which I won't read out, but it's classic Friedman uh, quote. And as monetarists actually argued at the time, even if a government was pursuing a constant money growth rule, a major supply side disturbance would reduce potential output permanently. That would mean that the level of prices consistent with any level of the money stock would be higher permanently. So monetary policy cannot reverse a negative supply side shock, such as OPEC-1. But if it was to accommodate it through an expansionary monetary policy, inflation takes hold. So monetarists were dismissive then of these arguments about supply side shocks, and they were equally dismissive of the sociological explanations. They argued that those expansive monetary policies generated excess demand with the accompanying rise in inflation. Trade unions and firms then pushed up nominal wages to attain an increase in real wages. So the actual rate of inflation is determined by excess demand and the expected rate of inflation. Rising unemployment, accelerating inflation follows. Because of disequilibrium inflation, in other words, the actual rate of inflation is higher than the expected rate, any real value of money income increases would be eroded by these increasing prices at a faster rate than anticipated. So as trade unions sought to realise real income increases in light of the unanticipated inflation, social unrest would rise. And therefore, for authors like Ward and George Zeese and David Laidler, Industrial unrest is a consequence, not a cause of inflation. And anyone listening to Jeremy Hunt today and his autumn statement, he was making basically the same point. Now, more recently, a, a rigorous analysis of this whole debate 
um, Britain's policy response to the inflation problem in the 70s has been provided by Nelson, as I mentioned, and his co-authors. And in, ter in, they, in, in terms of what they label the monetary policy neglect hypothesis, the argument they advance is that until the late 1970s, UK policymakers failed to recognise the primacy of monetary policy in controlling inflation. And instead, they had a strong attachment to the non-monetary approach to inflation, matching the anti-inflation measures employed. In other words, they went for wage and price controls. Why? The, the neglect was the result, as many would argue, uh, because of the result of the influence of the Radcliffe Committee, reporting in 1959, which, as Alan Waters wrote in 1970, quote, was an uncritical acceptance of neo-Keynesianism as a theoretical basis for monetary policy. Now, Nelson does a lot of econometric work, and that work is complemented with primary sources in the form of British parliamentary volumes, speeches and testimony, newspaper articles, contemporary published speeches, as well as some archive material from the Heath era to support his arguments. Now, additional evidence for Nelson's argument is to be found in the work on the Bank of England, as I mentioned, by Capey. In the wake of the Radcliffe report, Capey remarks that, quote, in the bank, voices in support of the control of money supply were few, and when heard, quietly ignored or put down. And he concludes that from the 50s to the 79, at the outset, stability was taken for granted. It was always there, without anyone apparently having to do anything to maintain it. A monetary policy was downplayed in importance, but monetary policy conducted by neglect failed. Financial stability was lost. In his account of British monetary policy post-67, Needham has taken issue with the views of Capey and Nelson and has said, look, policymakers did not neglect the money supply. And he suggests that the money, monetary policy neglect hypothesis contradicts public pronouncements of the most senior bank officials, and in so far that, and in, in so, and in so far as mistakes were made, these occurred because they mismanaged and mismeasured, sorry, the output gap. Now, economists have argued that the mismeasurement of the output gap as an excuse for poor policy decisions cannot be substantiated. Nelson and Nikolov actually conclude that the weakness of the output gap mismeasurement story is that it does not seem to account for the quantitative, quantitative magnitude of inflation in the 1970s. Now, the rest of my paper then is specifically concerned not with the output gap mismeasurement, which in re requires econometric techniques and which has been put to bed, in my view, by um, a group of economists, but instead focusing on the policy decisions made by the monetary authorities which show the persistence of a non-monetary view of inflation until the end of the 1970s. Now, Needham is absolutely correct to note that there was a change in emphasis to the money supply shortly after the devaluation of sterling in 1967. The IMF uh, arranged a seminar with the bank and treasury at that time to examine the relationship between financial factors affecting national income, the balance of payments and the implications of these for the techniques of economic forecasting. But the seminar went far beyond this. Um, the IMF had been very unimpressed with the ability of the UK authorities for many years to actually control money, monetary growth. And a lot of discussion centered around what importance should be attached to the money supply. That seminar was particularly uncomfortable for the majority of the officials in the bank and the treasury, not least because they were uneasy about accepting sharper and higher movements in interest rates as a trade-off for a greater control of the money supply. The authorities initially prevaricated on a, a number of is issues, chiefly whether the IMF's preferred definition of the money stock, DCE, could be applied to Britain. But they did finally acknowledge that they had paid too little attention to monetary policy after 45, and they both needed to adopt a clearer position on the money supply. And that manifested its way in two key, way, two key ways by the turn of the 70s. There was changes in the priorities in the gilt edge market. In the 1960s, the authorities had become more concerned with creating an orderly market for gilts and wishing to prevent high level of interest rates. As the authorities gradually began to realise that the higher normal interest rates in a period of inflation did not signify higher real interest rates, they actually uh, 
were prepared to accept more, more rapid interest rate movements. Greater interest rate flexibility then was associated with uh, a new method of monetary control called competition and credit control introduced in 71, 1971. But these upward movements in interest rates became politically unacceptable. And then in 1969, the Chancellor Roy Jenkins published a letter of intent to the IMF stating that he intended to keep the expansion of DCE within a figure of 400 million in 1969-1970. This did not actually imply that um, uh, the Chancellor was in any way a monetarist, uh, as many people have pointed out, pointed out. And by 1970, the Economist was urging uh, either the Conservative Labour Party to take a more resolute and scientific grip on the movement of the money supply. But right from the outset of the 70s, there was misgivings expressed about money supply targets, even down to semantics. One Treasury official noted, quote, something may depend on the interpretation put upon the word target. If it is meant to be something aimed at and hit, and by extension, something which would cause concern if missed, we can't have money supply targets. And what you discover from the official papers and the discussions from the Treasury and bank groups on monetary policy, and there were lots of theoretical and pra practical objections, but effectively they come out with all sorts of arguments. They didn't know enough about the relationships between the real economy and the monetary system. There's ignorance about what is the optimum growth of the money supply. Um, even if you could establish sufficient relationships, when do you tighten monetary policy uh, to achieve the money supply target? And it's also, they argue, impractical to fine tune the money supply. I think it's very fair to say that the Heath government never got to grips with the technicalities of the monetary policy, uh, supply policy during its time in office. It took the Chancellor, I think, until October 1970 before he admitted that he needed to do some reading on monetary policy to prepare for a speech and Treasury officials had to dust off a June 1970 briefing paper. There was a muddle through. And um, that became much more acute in the two years after October 1971. The broad money aggregate M3 grew by almost over 60 percent. Now, that's a horrific figure. The increase during the first nine months was caused by the growth in bank, bank lending. And thereafter, it was the rise in the public sector deficit, which was the main cause. Only a third of that debt was being sold to the non-bank private sector. In other words, the government was borrowing from the banking system. And the consequence of this was uh, asset price inflation, mainly in residential and commercial property, enormous increase in real domestic demand in 1973 to something like 7.8 percent. And as the monetarists have predicted, a rapid increase in inflation after a very uh, long and variable time lag to over 25 percent in 1975. In 2005, I, I helped the Churchill Archive Centre and the Centre for Contemporary British History to organise a witness seminar exploring the changing climate of opinion and economic policy making between 75 and 79. I won't read that quote out there from Brendan Sewell. He was a special assistant, to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. But quite frankly, ever since then, and the papers began to become available from 2004, 2005, evidence from the archive supports those remarks that you can read on the screen. The briefing paper on monetary policy for the incoming government in June 17 made it clear that the new emphasis on the money, money, money policy post 67 did not represent, represent a conversion to Friedman. But it did signify a gradual realisation, as I said, that the authorities, via the influence of the IMF, had to start to take the growth of the money supply seriously. But there was no groundswell of opinion of officials converted to the work of Friedman. There was a pragmatic acceptance that there should be a more important role for monetary policy, whatever that was. And if you look at the successive bank treasury monetary policy groups during the 1970s, the work is actually steeped in a non-monetary approach to inflation and too often resorts to first principles which had been raised in 1970, just as it appears that progress was being made. Duncan Needham explains that the Chancellor signed off an unpublished 20% target for M3 
and he believed at the time, the Chancellor, that was Anthony Barber, that level was necessary, a 20% increase in the growth of the money supply was necessary to finance a 5% GDP growth target in the 72 budget. Needham says this was an error, not one of omission. Well, Edward Heath, the Prime Minister, refused to raise bank rate, despite M3 growing even faster than the 20%. But Edward Heath believed that his expansionary monetary policy was anti-inflationary because it added to total output. Now, a 20% growth rate in M3 seems fantastic. But as Forrest Cappy has pointed out, the bank was struggling to understand monetary policy in this period. The newly recruited executive director for economics, Christopher Dow, was unsure whether monetary policy was expansionary or not when it was even growing at 20%. And in January 73, the Chancellor reported to the Cabinet of the increasing disquiet in European circles that the British had not taken more stringent measures to check the growth in public expenditure and to control the money supply. The view in the Treasury was that European thinking on the money supply target was pretty primitive. It appears to take little account of the institutional differences between countries and of the complexities of the linkages between money and income. Well, however primitive European thought was, the Treasury were completely unaware about the causes of the growth in M3, and they continued to express the view at the time that the money supply targets were difficult to implement and to publish, and then conceding that, quote, the difficulty of formulating a target at the moment stems largely from the obscurity of why money supply has risen so rapidly in the past year. They didn't understand what was happening. They were embarrassed, they said, by the rise in M3. But John Knott, who later became, of course, a defence minister in the Thatcher cabinet, suggested to Treasury officials that, quote, the more we can play down the importance of M3 and emphasise its fickle nature, as the Bank of England had been doing, the better. I cannot really envisage the M3 figures being of use to us. The view then that the money supply targets had little operational importance for the control of inflation continued to be expressed at senior levels in the Treasury through the autumn of 74 and into 75. There was a call that a target could be published in the Treasury, but that was just knocked aside by senior officials. And instead, the focus, as you can see there from those two quotes, uh, with the key points highlighted in bold, is to strengthen wage rest restraint through a statutory incomes policy. Let's control wages and prices. Now, as Forrest Capey has shown, three months after the rate of inflation had reached 25% in June 1975, the bank began a basic discussion on what it believed monetary policy should be. And Sir Kit McMahon, his quote there in 75 is, is very, very telling. It would only be possible to contain inflation in late 20th century democratic industrial societies with the aid of more or less continuous incomes policies based broadly on consent. There were signs in December 75 that the Treasury and Bank were in agreement about monetary policy. There was a joint working group called the Bridgman Working Group, and their views were clear if you read them. The working party does not accept the monetarist view that M1, M3 or any other single indicator is of overriding importance. Monetary policy should not be the main instrument in demand management or controlling inflation. That is pure and utter non-monetary view of inflation. And yet, notice this last quote from the report. It seems safer to assume that the risks to monetary policy being destabilising will be minimised if the money stock is held to a fairly smooth path from year to year. Now, that line reads like a conversion to a Friedman constant money growth rule. It was not. So Douglas Wasp, Permanent Secretary to the Treasury, played up these disagreements between the bank and the Treasury following a meeting to discuss this report in January 76 and told the Chancellor in March 76 that our attempts to reach an agreed analytical position have not exactly been crowned with success. And then Michael Bridgman himself explained in a note about the formulation of monetary policy in the 1976 budget statement that the thrust of counterinflation policy remained pay restraint. Action to control the money supply would only be taken if the pay policy was, quote, partly successful and any reinforcing monetary action would be used to, quote, avoid a collapse of confidence in financial markets. 
Now, following Kit McMahon's appearance at the 2005 Witness Seminar, Gordon Pepper, who was a partner at the firm uh, W. Greenwell and & Co. and was an influential advisor on Margaret Thatcher in the 70s, he wrote to McMahon to discover, discuss some of the uh, arguments that both he and I had outlined in our 2001 book. Why would a government introduce a money supply target? Could it be for genuine purposes or political economy purposes? along the lines suggested by John Ford of the Bank of England. In short, a political economy reason would be concerned with the political presentation of a money supply strategy to a wide variety of audiences. In other words, you're not a genuine monetarist. McMahon's reply was unequivocal. My reason for supporting a publicly announced money supply target in mid-76 was very much on the lines you set out. Neither Christopher Dow, John Ford, nor I believed at all in Friedman, Friedman's monetarism. Healy publicly announced a, a, a target for M3 on the 22nd of July 76, much to the chagrin of Douglas Wass, who stated, I think we've come very close to overdoing this targetary business. And he told the principal private secretary to the Chancellor, Nicholas Monk, that this, his views were shared by the majority of the Treasury. Now, as Duncan Needham notes, given at that stage the Labour government's lack of credibility with financial markets, Healy had to introduce and pay close attention to a monetary target. But this commitment was transient and not genuine. Dennis Healy did not accept a monetary view of inflation and later remarked that the monetarist mumbo jumbo could not be ignored so long as the markets took it seriously. And as Jeff Littler attested at the 2005 witness seminar. It could hardly be said the monetary targets to have constituted a major feature of the government's policy. It was a piece, but there was not a great deal of discussion. It did not change very much over the period. Pay policy changed almost every day. Was concurs, commenting that even though the money supply assumed some importance in 76, the shift was not nearly to the extent of accepting the precepts of the monetarists. And even while Ed Nelson himself has acknowledged the UK moved away briefly from the non-monetary views of inflation in 76 to 1977, this was fleeting. Healy observed a conflict developed in Whitehall between what he called unreconstructed Keynesians and unbelieving monetarists, and the government continued to rely on prices and incomes policies and in fact increased government expenditure in 77 and 79, and quantitative regulations, lest you'll remember the corset to control monetary growth. All of this is an approach steeped in the non-monetary view of inflation. And yes, the government did choose to pursue money supply targets over the exchange rate in the autumn of 77. That M3, Sterling M3 target was overshot by something like 3%, which has been suggested they were not acting decisively enough. Some conclusions. Writing in 1976, Jeff Williamson and Geoffrey Wood commented that Britain's inflation performance post-67 was on the whole not primarily attributable to economic illiteracy on the part of the authorities. The objective of full employment was regarded as of paramount importance. But they noted then, quote, the undoubted truth was that the authorities underestimated the long run importance of monetary factors. The IMF had found the bank and the treasury resistant. Between 70 and 74, the Conservative government, Edward Heath, did not accept the need for monetary restraint. During the remainder of the 70s, it appeared the Labour government had conceded the argument made by the monetarists, but this was superficial. The authorities did not accept the premise of monetarism, and monetary targets were introduced to buy credibility with the financial markets. So Douglas Wass's quote there from his account of the 1970s, I think, is very telling. Now, as Ben Broadbent, the current director, deputy governor in charge of monetary policy at the bank, has observed, it's little wonder the UK's inflation performance, as I've shown during the 70s, was so poor compared to other countries. Policymakers believed that neither inflation expectations nor the output gap, <clears throat> if they could calculate it, seemed to matter. In short, monetary policy didn't really have a material part to play in either explaining or controlling inflation. The evidence I present in this paper, I would argue, confirms the work of Ed Nelson and his co-authors.
that the authorities in that period ascribed to a non-monetary view of inflation. If we were to just stand back and think about 50 years of a, a slow and more gradual approach on uh, monetary policy and the move towards monetary explanations, I think it would be fair to say the authorities have since 1970 consistently failed in uh, with their attention on bank lending to the private sector. Now, it's not criticism that they have actually failed to forecast bank lending. It's notoriously difficult to predict. The criticism is they failed to realise the significance of what was happening when it was known that bank lending had either become very buoyant, there was too much money in the circulation, or sluggish. Think of the early 1990s. So to those economists out there who might feel that the arguments over monetarism, debt management policy, should only concern economic and financial historians, I think many of the lessons post-75 have still yet to be drawn by policymakers and are especially pertinent for central banks and monetary economists in the 2020s. Daniela, I think I got it in time, 40 minutes. Yeah, that's great. Let me just stop the recording so we can um, open the floor for questions. So thanks a lot, Michael, for a very interesting presentation, which I think raises some very relevant points for the discussion we we are seeing and having in these days. So um, let me stop the recording. Thanks a lot.